Let's go. So, hi everybody. Before I introduce myself, uh, just uh, a few words. I'm going to speak about, the, about Fedora. So Fedora is a Linux distribution based on RPM, and uh, it has several releases. And the one I've been using during this talk is Rawhide, which basically means the um, latest version of each package is go into Rawhide, and then they, they settle down. So it's basically the same as unstable in Debian. Okay, so uh, we are using that as a test bed. All the binary package in Fedora are compiled with GCC, and that's a strong requirement. And basically, we're trying to switch to Clang, not for the distribution, but just to test both the packages and Clang so that we can gather more information. So that's the overall topic of the talk. So uh, I'm Serge. I'm working for Red Hat as a compiler engineer, mostly on LLVM. And we're going to speak about Clang and Fedora. But before we speak about Fedora, let's speak about, about Firefox. Um, so this Fesco team stuff is the Fedora Engineering Steering Committee. And whenever you want to do something that does not obey the rule of Fedora, you need to open an issue, and then there is a discussion, and something happens or doesn't happen. And this particular discussion was interesting because uh, Firefox upstream decided not to support GCC anymore as their native compiler, which means that for both OS X, Windows, and Linux, the package is compiled with Clang. There are two main advantages of doing that, which are if you take apart the quality of Clang, of course, is uh, you only need to, need to support one compiler and not one compiler for Windows, one compiler for OS X, and one compiler for Linux. You've got the same compiler, so whatever compiler-specific stuff you're going to support is only going to happen once. So that's cool for them. And the other more technical thing is that Firefox is being partially rewritten in Rust, and the Rust compiler is using LLVM as an internal representation. And Firefox is still using C++. So the both, if both use the same internal representation, it opens a lot of opportunities for optimization at link time, which is not possible if the C++ code is compiled with GCC and the other part is compiled with LLVM. So there are good motivation for, Fedora, for uh, Firefox to switch to Clang. But then um, they still accept GCC fixes, <coughs> that is, if the Firefox code base does not compile with GCC and you've got a patch, they accept it, but they don't test it anymore. So as a packager, what should you do? Either support the GCC build, which is a lot of effort, or switch to the same compiler as upstream and use Clang, and which is okay because Clang is also packaged in Fedora, but uh, it does not obey the rule of Fedora. So they asked for an exception, and first they got it, and then the, ex the exception got removed. And that's the topic of that thread. And why did it got removed? There was um, quite a lot of objection to using Clang. And without going into the details, some of them were related to the quality of the debug information generated by Clang compared to the debug information generated by GCC, which is a relatively well-known uh, topic. Another one was related to the default flag, like uh, for exception handling, whether uh, asynchronous unwind was activated by default or not uh, for all targets. And GCC and Clang don't have the same behavior to that respect. Uh, a more um, interesting one was the support of semantic interposition. So semantic interposition is an elf thing that states basically that any symbol that is um, exported in a shared library um, may have its behavior or its implementation change at runtime, for instance, through LD preload, which means that it's a strong uh, optimization barrier for any interprocedural optimization. And by default, GCC obeys the ELF rules, and Clang doesn't. Uh, Clang did not have any flag to 
enforce that rule until very recently. And so that's a big difference. It's a big difference for our performance. Uh, I know that in Fedora, the Python library switched it to no semantics interpretation for, the, for their GCC build because of the performance impact. Uh, but by default, uh, it's not the case in GCC, and Clang has the opposite behavior. So that could be a blocker. Uh, a very important topic was uh, security flags. All Fedora packages are compiled by default by, with uh, a set of optimization flags, and you've got, of course, minus O2, plus basically most of GCC security features turned on. One of them is Fortify source. Uh, it's more for C code. Um, and it was not well respected by Clang. If you activate that, the Clang compiles your code correctly, but the security hardening does not actually happen on all situations, which is a problem. When I'm saying Clang, that's Clang 9, not Clang 10. Um, someone claims that the stack protection thing were not as evolved in Clang as in GCC. Uh, they rightfully pointed out that stack clash protection was not implemented in Clang at all, while it is in, in GCC. So basically, uh, one of the strong opposition was if you compile your code with Clang, it's less secure, with some definition of secure, uh, than if you compile it with GCC, and that led to Firefox still being supported for GCC by the Fedora guys, which is for a, from a maintainer point of view, that's not a very good property, but that's how it is. So we told ourselves that's a good opportunity to improve Clang and maybe to remove some of uh, this constraint. So uh, the Fortify, so uh, I, I had a look to that, and for Fortify, it was very interesting. The way fortification is implemented in the glibc is basically you've got your uh, mem copy, and then if Fortify is activated, you've got an inline definition that overrides the behavior of mem copy. But um, the clone behavior was if you use um, a built-in, and mem copy is considered as a recognized built-in, then you don't care about any overloads that would be given by the user. You're using the actual built-in semantic. And so they were not using the fortified semantic because it was recognized as a built-in. So we changed that. And now when you, comp when you compile with Clang and Fortify on, and you found a memcopy, if there is an inline definition that changes the behavior of memcopy, Clang is going to honor that version and so you've got the runtime checks and so on. So that's one more step forward. That's not full Fortify specification. Well, there is no Fortify specification. There is just uh, the GCC implementation, which is directly linked to the GDBC one. But if you want to have the same observable, observable behavior, uh, you're getting closer. So that's one good thing. Uh, there's also warnings. At some point, you could say, and many packages do compile with W error, that if GCC detects uh, a security issue and warns about it, maybe Clang should warn about it too. And one of the issues was sprintf. Uh, if you can comp uh, compute statically the size of your buffer, then you can do some kind of checks whether the format is going to fit into the buffer or not. And uh, GCC has some not that much advanced analysis uh, on that topic, and Clang had a few of them, but uh, uh, to a lesser extent. And now, we, uh, Clang implements full understanding of the printf specification and can compute the lower bound of the um, buffer size requirements and warn you if uh, the buffer is not large enough. So I don't expect that warning to be issued a lot of time, but still, uh, that's something that can be now detected. And it had its end in Clang, but probably not Clang 10. It will be in Clang 11. And that's something that GCC does not implement now as much. So we are raising each other, but that's uh, saying, uh, no, 
yeah, that same uh, emulation, so I'm totally fine with that. Uh, about semantic interposition, that sounds like a very difficult thing to implement because it basically means that whenever you've got an interprocedural optimization in Clang, you need to change uh, the behavior of this optimization depending on the status of the symbol based on basically its um, visibility and linkage type. The good thing was it was already implemented at the LLVM level, but there was no switch to activate that in Clang. So what looked like a tremendous task actually was not that difficult, and which made it possible to land it in one week or so. So now the default in Clang, Clang 11, is still no semantic interposition, but you can force the flag to uh, minus F semantic interposition, then it will be respected just like in GCC for a package where it matters to have symbols uh, change at both load time or runtime. So just to give you a, an hint about the impact, if you've got uh, this, small, uh, this small code with semantic interposition on, you can inline foo, but you can't inline bar because bar could be changed uh, at runtime. And so changing its implementation would not uh, have the same impact. Uh, if you inline it, then uh, the, the LD preload thing will not change all the behavior of bar. Then there is stack clash protection. Uh, funnily enough, that's, uh, so, so the stack clash uh, vulnerability is uh, one year and a half old, and uh, the um, the flag got into GCC relatively quickly and not at all in Clang. The basic idea is whenever you allocate memory on the stack, um, if it's uh, larger than one page, then there is a risk that uh, it overlaps the page guard allocated by the kernel, and so your stack is going to overlap with your heap which is not a property you want, and that's the beginning of the, um, of the attack. And so the, um, the countermeasure is basically don't allocate large stack, but allocate by, uh, by chunk of one page and touch memory each time you do that, so you're sure that you will trigger uh, the page guard allocated by the kernel, and then you've got uh, your signal and uh, um, you're safe. So uh, there is an implementation for x86 uh, under review. Uh, it turned out to be a bit more difficult than expected, and it's only for x86. It's obviously very uh, architecture dependent. Uh, but you can see on that small example that you're allocating uh, a large amount of stack, and instead of having a, a single sub, uh, you have two of them with a move uh, interleaved, which actually touches uh, the page. The good thing with x86 is that uh, when, whenever you make a function call, you're saving the return address on the stack, so you've got a, free, uh, a, f a lot of free probes in the stack, so you can implement that locally at the function level, and it may not be the case of all architecture, which is why it's not implemented at a higher level. So, um, okay, most of the, with that set of patches, most of the points raised during the Firefox stuff got handled, and so it, okay, maybe uh, the situation can evolve, but it also rings a bell. What about the next package that want to switch for, uh, to Clang upstream, and what are we going to do? Or maybe we could state it otherwise, we learned a lot by using Clang as a compiler for uh, Firefox within Fedora. Maybe if we don't compile only Firefox but all the package, we can learn much more things. So that's what we did. Basically, changing the default compiler in a separate build route, so in another Fedora build, and gathering information, and that's the second part of the talk, sharing some of the insight we get. So we are still at the... Um, uh, information gathering step, so no uh, answers, but uh, good uh, hints about where we, can, we could drive Clang, and that's for real, uh, real packages. 
So uh, all the um, data collection, or oh, the setup of the build route and so on was done by uh, Tom Stellar. So uh, huge thanks to, uh, for him because I'm not uh, proficient enough on that part. And so he did all the dirty stuff and I only had to grab full logs, which is totally uh, in my scope. And then starting to implement the thing in LLVM, which I, I could start to work on. So uh, it's not about Clang, but it's about Fedora. Fedora Rawhide requires Python 3. We could still depend on Python 2, but well, uh, the world is moving, so let's move with it. Well, the world started to move 10 years ago, so it's a good time to start to move uh, on our own. Um, many tools, and I'm not speaking about utility scripts, but tools that the end user actually sees, uh, depend on Python. So that's especially the case for LLDB, for all the uh, debugger scripting parts, but that's also the case for Clang Format or Clang Format Diff. And so uh, if we want to ship these scripts in Fedora, we need to, to have these scripts run correctly in Python 3. Uh, but if you have a look at the requirement for LLVM, it's Python 2.7 uh, still now. Uh, so we had to port all the scripts to being portable between Python 2 and Python 3, which was quite a huge task, not a very difficult one, because we are not using uh, a lot of string manipulation in the script, so that was basically okay. But still, um, uh, it was some kind of an effort, but now all the Python code base of LLVM is compatible with both Python version. And I started in a thread which received relatively good um, feedback that by the end of this year, we could probably drop Python 2 and switch to Python 3, which would not be, and Python 2 is not supported for this whole year. So it totally makes sense. And LLVM doesn't have a strong history of supporting uh, uh, aging technologies. So we are upgrading the CMake version uh, quite often, so we can also upgrade uh, the Python version. But at least that was a requirement for Fedora, and uh, this requirement is uh, fulfilled. So another specific tool to Fedora is Anubin. So Anubin, basically, uh, it's a plugin for GCC, and it records all the compiler flags into nodes, so that for each function, in the binary, we know which compiler flags were used. And that's more mostly used for security. You know which security flags were used for each function. And then um, you know for your whole binary if some functions were not compiled with the appropriate flags. Um, so that's a GCC plugin. And it relies on some specific linker supports. Basically, it was about um, nodes were attached to function through uh, um, elf groups. And when you merge groups, the nodes got removed by LLD. And it's no longer the case, but it was something we, we needed to, to implement. And if we want to make one step further, this plugin, this Anubin plugin, could also be implemented uh, for Clang, and that's uh, being done internally uh, at Red Hat by a, a colleague of mine with my support. So uh, uh, as this, uh, this plugin is used by default, we, it was important to do that task. Uh, then about the real normal package, now that we have set up uh, a decent environment, how do you change the underlying compiler? Because we've got all these spec files. The spec file is just a recipe about how you build your actual Fedora package. Uh, how do you change from the system compiler to, uh, to Clang? It turns out that the easiest way to do that was to provide a new set of RPM macro, basically stating that whenever you mention the uh, person CC, it's going to be redirected to Clang. And the same thing for make, CMake, and so on. Uh, it assumes that everybody is writing a, an abstract description of uh, the build process, which was not the case um, at all. But uh, fixing that is also a way to fix package, uh, package description. So that was a good road to follow. 
And once we gather that, we, we get some builds that fail, we get logs, and we can grab through that to understand why we've got errors. So that's the basic process. And that's the results. So uh, uh, on the 4,000 package we, we rebuilt, uh, three quarters of them just rebuilt faith, uh, without any issue which is both a good surprise, but it also means that 1,000 of them <laughs> remains. Not, uh, some of them didn't build with GCC either. I mean, because of some reason uh, which are out of my scope. So we put that, this one uh, apart. And so we are interested in the 1,141 uh, 1, ones that actually failed. And so I had to dig through the error logs and understand why. And so, um, more, almost 300 of them just failed because they were compiling with Clang, but using some GCC-specific flags. And so we get an error. So the, um, we also had some Clang-specific flags that were added uh, by us in the process. And they were not supported by GCC, which means that our uh, instrumentation of GCC failed, which is also good information uh, uh, to some extent. So Stacklash protection is not um, respected, but we knew that. So some ARM-specific things about Neon and Quadrup uh, accuracy floats. Uh, something about how you pass arguments, which we could probably ignore in Clang. There's already a bunch of flags that we just in your, so we could add that one. VAR tracking is to improve the quality of the debug information. So we can relate that to the quality of debug information in Clang. But we could probably ignore that one too because, well, it's just debug information. It doesn't affect the user experience at all. Uh, no trample line is more related to uh, GCC implementing nested function through trample line. So it's a way to control that. And no enforce uh, exception and leak specs. It's something to lighten the cost of exceptions or make or unshrink uh, the binary size. So maybe we could implement that. I don't know. Uh, Sometimes we just uh, fail to hook uh, Clang and we, uh, instead of GCC and we detected that. So uh, to detect that, uh, we just go through all the binaries generated. Uh, well, shipped in the package, and we go into the command section of the binary, and if we don't find a compile with Clang, then it means that we did not compile any object. If we file compile with Clang, it means that at least one object of the package got compiled with Clang, which is not all of them. Uh, there is always, unfortunately, the GCC, well, unfortunately, uh, for our tracking thing, uh, the GCC comment because uh, we are still using the CRT stuff and, the, and GCC as a linker. So there is always the GCC uh, watermark. But at least some of them were not compiled at all, so we need to, to understand why. Uh, some people find it smart to compile with W error. And um, for our task, it's not smart at all because uh, Clang and GCC differ a lot to the extent of the warning implemented and what kind of area of situation they catch. And so something like printf being redefined uh, is not an error on GCC and it is, or well, it's not a warning on GCC, but it is in Clang. Uh, ignoring return value, um, detective infinite recursions, this kind of thing. So it's it's probably, we are not going to implement the same set of warnings, so I, I don't quite know what to do about that one. Probably remove W error would be uh, a decent approach. Um, but uh, I'm not going to spend much time on that. Um, some, when you activate FastMath, you've got some specific implementation of the math uh, library, and it turns out that GCC relies on some new symbols that's finished by finite, and these symbols, sometimes we fail to link with them when using Clang. I've not, I can't say why, but so it could either be a packaging issue or uh, a Clang issue, I don't know. Uh, but still, it means that there is some implicit things are coded 
in GCC or in the package that are not well described. Uh, the famous configure error. We have got a lot of them. Uh, you may be aware of the difficulty of writing portable autoconf tests. And uh, if you're not, having a look at all the tests that fail because Clang is not capable of compiling a C code. That's the only output we get from the configure. We could, of course, have a look to the config.log. But uh, so many packages fail just to configure because uh, using Clang during the configuration step just fails. My hint about that is that because uh, we use some specific compiler flags, they are used during the configuration step. And so if we've got any of these W error things or unsupported argument thing, we're going to detect that at configuration step. And so we just fail to configure. Um, does it mean that we need to rewrite the configure step, which means contacting each upstream package to, port, to update that or do something else? I can't tell, but um, that's something which will not be very pleasant to fix and maybe not of much interest uh, with respect to just Clang. Uh, something that is important for Clang, but only in Fedora, it sometimes Clang fails to find its, some part of the runtime either because it's not well packaged or because there are some assumptions that are not met. I can't, I am doing the packaging, so <laughs> I do hope that it's not a packaging issue, but I fear it is, and we need to check that. I can't tell about the GCC underscore C, and I did not took time to, to investigate what this implement, but we can discuss about this a bit later. Sometimes uh, there's disagreement on the standard. So that's something that is very valuable either for Clang if uh, they wrongly disagree or for the upstream package if it means that they could uh, improve their code base. Uh, so sometimes it's linked to um, GCC extension. So the one um, uh, like you don't support a nested function. Sometimes it's comparison between pointers uh, should be equal or different but not um, comparison, and uh, I don't know if what the standard actually says about that, but obviously GCC and Clang disagree, so maybe we could improve the situation. And sometimes there is just use of undeclared identifier, and I, I, I would be surprised to investigate and check why Clang doesn't find the identifier while GCC does. So that's more of an upstream issue. So the language extension stuff, here you have a nested, uh, nested function something you can easily write with a lambda in C++, but GCC allows to do that uh, in C for an extension, and some package rely on that. And it's probably going to be difficult to make them change their mind, because if they choose that extension, it's because it makes their development flow easier, or I don't know. Um, and when you get, you try to compile that code, there is a warning like, okay, Clang is not supporting that, and it's not going to support that. So it's clearly stating in the, in the error message that um, we can't do anything about that. Or we could maintain a patch uh, um, at the federal level, but uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, OpenMP, and it's also related, it's probably related to either packaging issue or dependency issues. Sometimes Clang doesn't find the, the runtime support for OpenMP, or the configuration step fails and fails to uh, detect OpenMP when compiled with Clang. We need to investigate because that's um, not a good thing if Clang users can't use OpenMP out of the box in Fedora. But probably not a Clang issue, more probably uh, either a configuration issue or a packaging issue. And some packages just use, still use GCC because there are art codes make or the art code GCC or G++ uh, either in the package or in the actual um, upstream sources, which makes sense because if you're not sensible to portability, you just use GCC and it works. And there's no reason to, to worry about that until you realize that some users may want to compile with Clang with good argument, or Clang, or whatever, it could be 
Intel compiler because of performance, I don't know. And, and then it could be an improvement uh, both for the packager and for upstream to have a more generic build uh, process. So that's the end of, uh, of my talk. Um, so uh, the ideas I, I would like to, to share, I, I'd like to share with that talk was um, there's a lot of learn, there's a lot of thing to learn while having such a diverse set of programs to compile with Clang, and that's far from the test suite of LLVM. So a good opportunity to improve, uh, probably making all this information available in a way that anybody could access them, opening all the bugs on Bugzia or on GitHub, depending on <laughs> how it evolves, uh, could be a good thing. Um, it's probably less important for the LVM community to do the upstream work. I mean, trying to update every package packaged in Fedora to support Clang um, is more of a social task than of an engineering task, so it requires special skills. Uh, but some people may be open to that and some may not. Uh, but that's still an opportunity for upstream to improve too. But I see a lot of uh, good things for Clang, uh, at least for the past months when I've been working on that. And so it also fills my daily job on interesting tasks. So on a personal point, that's a good thing. And I wanted to last with that final error. So if you are compiling in C++ and you name one of your member function, dprintf and then you compile with Fortify source, but you order your includes in a way that sometimes you will get uh, the macro redefinition from the STD, STDIO headers and sometimes you don't, then you end up with part of your class having a dprintf member and the actual implementation using another name. And uh, so you, you've got an error just because uh, uh, of basically macros and the way they interact with Fortify source. And that was a funny one. Only one in the whole Fedora uh, code base, but uh, an unexpected one. So now if you have any question, I'm happy to share more information or, yep. Uh, thanks for your talk. I was curious about, um, you mentioned earlier a GCC plugin about recording the exact compiler invocation in the notes yep. section of the ELF object. That sounds generically useful Theoretically, that could be a dash F flag in the compiler. It doesn't need to be a plugin, right? So the question was, uh, recording all the optimization flag and security flags uh, is something that is generally useful. And so why using a plugin and not uh, an actual uh, compiler flag? Uh, maybe, oh, uh, I'm not the uh, one developing the, that plugin. Uh, the plugin is open, so that's not a uh, proprietary uh, reason, but that could be. Um, my guess would be it's easier to write a plugin. It may be the first step before you go into the code base. That's how uh, academics do. They don't write into the code LLVM code base. They first write plugins, and eventually it gets in. So a plugin is a good first step. So that could be a, a sane, an engineering uh, answer would be why not starting with a plugin? It's easier. You can maintain it. You don't have to get through the uh, review process of the actual compiler. And should it evolve into a, an actual compiler flag, um, it does make sense to me at least. Uh, yeah, whatever order. Thank you for the interesting talk and many interesting details. Uh, well, let me wonder. Uh, do you consider this journey uh, successful for you? And also, like, as you still like, got a lot accomplished, uh, what are the most valuable outcomes which you got for, for your day-to-day uh, -day work uh, out of this project? So, your, so my, the question is... For testing, but uh, for testing uh, Fedora, but uh, what, uh, what kind of testing uh, could you elaborate uh, you get out of, uh, out of this project? Uh, I don't quite understand the question. Can you repeat, please? You said uh, you did this project for testing. Uh, yeah. Testing what? Uh, can you give more details? Uh, what you, you tried to test with this? Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, we did that for testing. Uh, what's next? And what are the, the conclusion or the outcomes? 
And so uh, my personal take on that is uh, Klang did, or Klang LVM did improve a lot thanks to this testing uh, on, the, on the Firefox part. And so from all the information we gathered uh, on the larger scale uh, tests, there's a lot of situation where we could improve Clang based on the GCC experience, basically. And that's a good thing. I mean, uh, it's not only about trying to match GCC. So that's the initial motivation. But in the end, what you get is uh, more feature for the Clang users. And I'm going to go on that way because the, not for all the flags, I'm going to sort out the things that I'm interested in and the things that uh, seems valuable for Clang as a whole or could be accepted because like nested function, I could find it interesting on, on my own, but it won't get accepted upstream. So I won't work on that. And uh, it also provide opportunities for people to work on that uh, apart from just uh, the LVM team in Red Hat. So, Basically, it provides more opportunity to fix bugs or add new features uh, and driven by actual test case and not only my uh, imagination. Uh, Victor? I know that the previous operating system is fully built by Clang, and there is also a project to rebuild uh, Debian using Clang. Yep. Are you collaborating with this project? I'm collaborating with uh, the Debian project on that. So, to say, so the question was, uh, there's not only Fedora, the BSD systems, some of them are compiling with Clang. Uh, there is um, a side project of Debian, of recompiling Debian with Clang, which, is, which has more, much more history than we have. Uh, are we on our, in our bubble or collaborating? So it happens that I personally know the guy in charge of that for Debian. And so we do collaborate both on the packaging side Whenever I have a patch that I need to apply to LLVM, I'm discussing with him, are you applying that patch in Debian 2? Why for this kind of thing? And also for uh, the um, general uh, approach, especially on, for Firefox, because this guy appears to also be uh, in the Firefox team. So uh, for instance, all the Fortify stuff and the Stack Clash protection stuff, while being uh, reviewed by LLVM, were also tested on the Firefox uh, version, recompiled, uh, because they plan to use it. They are really interested in that feature. So even if they don't make it to the Fedora build, they will make it to the Firefox build. So there is some kind of cooperation. cooperation. One, one more question, I think. Yeah. Uh, what about actual testing? You are just, just testing that it builds. No. Home, home, it pains me that you have so much, so less trust into the packager job. Uh, <laughs> whenever you do a package, you've got a test section, and basically you're running the test. An empty test section. Um, no, how, it's. How many, how many packages have, actually have tests? Well, I can only speak about the package I maintain in Fedora, which is a very small amount, but all of them do have a test section. So it's also true that uh, for some architectures, the test section of LLVM has a if arm, then OK. But well, we're actually running the test and ignoring the results, but not for x86. <laughs> so, but uh, there is a test section, and we are encouraged to use it. And I think oh, some I've not mentioned that, but some of them we had sick fault in the test. Like uh, the tests were run. And uh, this is fault. And uh, from my experience on, on working on obfuscating compiler, we don't like debugging this situation because you don't know the test, you don't know the actual program, and that's a pain. But that's one thing that could be very interesting because if, if Clang is miscompiling something, it's a that's a logical step after getting yeah. the packages. Okay, so we better stop there. But thanks very much.